Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Miss Angler's biology class. I am Miss Angler. In today's video, we are going to look at another episode on homeostasis. In particular, we are going to focus on aldosterone. Now, the sister video that goes along with this is the ADH video, which is the video that is focused on regulating the water in the body. Aldosterone regulates the salt in the body. You will need to have watched both of these videos to fully understand how the body regulates both salt and water. They are um, linked to each other, so you do need to know both of them. And of course, this video needs to be known by grade 11s and grade 12s. So this content is repeated in grade 12. You learn it the first time in grade 11, but you do need to know it in grade 12 as well under the homeostasis section. Now, if you do like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and make sure you are subscribed with your notifications turned on. I post new videos every Tuesday and Thursday. If you are in matric and you are interested in improving your mark and getting a distinction, then you should think about joining my membership. I do live lessons. You get exclusive videos that only members have access to. And of course, you get free access to my legendary study guide. Now, as I have mentioned before, homeostasis is the way in which the body regulates its internal environment within narrow limits, hence the name homo and then stasis referring to the internal state of the body. Now, for this particular video, we're going to focus on aldosterone. And aldosterone is a hormone that is responsible for salt in the body. Now, salt plays a really, really important role in maintaining your blood volume. In other words, um, if you've lost blood, um, so there's any trauma to your body, perhaps your blood pressure has uh, dropped, or um, you've just been sweating a lot and you've lost a lot of water through sweating, um, aldosterone is going to come in and save the day by increasing the salt in your blood and therefore increasing the water in your blood, returning your blood volume back to normal. Now, aldosterone is quite tricky because it's not a hormone that we make initially. And what I mean by that is when you make the hormone aldosterone, there are actually two hormones that come before it. So unlike some of the other processes when we do homeostasis where it's just one hormone doing all the work, this particular um, homeostatic function involves three different hormones. And I'm going to show you how one connects into the next and their effects. So where is all of this process taking place, this homeostatic function? Well, in two locations. The first being the kidney. And specifically inside of the kidney, we are going to be looking at the nephron inside the kidney and how it plays a role in detecting the changes in salt. And then the second location is in the adrenal gland. And this is the gland that is going to be responsible for producing aldosterone and secreting it and then sending that hormone off to the kidneys, nephrons, to control the amount of salt in the bloodstream. Now, a really important element about this lesson that I want you to understand is how salt influences water absorption. What's interesting is that often in the classroom, we learn about water regulation before we learn about salt. But what's interesting is that actually we should be learning about salt first and then water. And you'll see now why that is the case. Essentially, it has to do with the very simple idea that water is attracted to wherever salt is. So let's imagine if I divide a section in our body with a membrane. And on one side of the membrane, I have a lot of salt particles. And we may or may not remember these words from grade 10, but you may remember the words hypertonic and hypotonic. So on one side, we have a lot of salt particles, and on the other, we have much less. So on the side that has a lot of salt, we would say that is hypertonic. On the other side, hypotonic. 
Now, the interesting thing about this is salt is actually a really difficult uh, substance to move in the body. And you actually have to actively move it around. It means you need to use energy to move it. Now, the tricky part with that is the energy aspect. It's not very passive and you need special uh, channels in the cell membrane to move these substances. Water, on the other hand, is passive, which means it's going to move on its own. And it doesn't need special channels. It can just move easily through osmosis and move through a membrane, no problem. And so, in order for us to sufficiently and successfully move water in our body, what we end up having to do is we need to use energy to make one side of our membranes hypertonic, meaning you've got lots of salts on the one side. And the other side of the membrane must be hypotonic. So this is actually what aldosterone does. And it forces salt across the membrane through channel proteins onto the other side. And so it makes it even more salty. Now, in doing this, a natural uh, occurrence that happens after this is all the water molecules on the other side, the hypotonic area, they are going to follow where the salt is. And the reason for that is water is attracted to wherever salt is. And so what happens is you have this natural passive movement, which means no energy required, where now water molecules start to move onto the other side of the membrane. And so that means that water can accumulate in your blood, Maybe it can accumulate in your muscle or in your tissues. And that's a good thing if you want to absorb water back into the body. What's also really cool is it can go the other way as well if you want to get rid of excess water and excess salts. And so this is the whole idea around how salt and water play a like role or relationship with one another. And the sort of rule of wherever the salt goes the water will follow. Now what we're going to do is we're going to apply this idea of wherever salt goes, you know, water follows. And we're going to look at how the body regulates the salt in the bloodstream. Now, my example here is linked to perhaps you've been sweating profusely. You've lost a lot of water, a lot of salt. Maybe you've had blood loss and your blood pressure is dropping. And so these external factors can ultimately influence what is happening internally. So the first thing that we always start off with is there needs to be a stimulus. There needs to be a trigger, you know, something that is starting this whole response. And so when we have a change in what we call osmolarity, and you may remember this word from my previous video, Osmolarity refers to the amount of solutes or salts that are dissolved in a liquid. Now, in this instance, the number of salt is decreasing in the bloodstream. And if the salt is decreasing, the water is going to be influenced. Okay, That's a really, really big deal. It means that your blood pressure and your blood volume is decreasing, which is not a good thing. Now, that stimulus has to be felt by somebody. So now we move on to the picture that we can see here. This is what we call the renal capsule. Now, you may also know what the renal capsule is from your previous lessons. It's also known as the Malphigian body. This is where ultrafiltration happens. It's where the blood goes into the nephron at the very beginning and where we filter out everything that we want to keep. So what happens is blood is going to move into the renal capsule and it's going to move through particularly this first branch, which is called the afferent arterial. Now, afferent means it is entering, it's going in. Now, in the walls of the afferent arterial are sensory cells. And these sensory cells pick up that there is not enough salt in the blood. We need to put more in. So to do that, what happens is these little cells that line the afferent arterial, they are going to secrete a substance called uh, renin. Now, I want you to think of renin as a stimulating substance. It stimulates and it triggers the production of what we want to get to, which is aldosterone. We're not there yet, but we've got to make renin first. 
Now that we have made renin in these little arterioles, the renin then triggers another response. And what it causes or what it stimulates is the production of our second hormone, which is angiotensin. Now, you don't need to know a huge amount of detail about where it's made, how it's made, etc. You simply need to know that, A, we create renin, and renin then stimulates the production of angiotensin. Now, from there, angiotensin is going to be sent to the control center. Remember, we're always following this sort of template answer. We need to be sending this information to a control center because somebody needs to do something about this. And the control center is the adrenal cortex. Now that we are in the adrenal cortex or the adrenal gland, if you're more familiar with that, we take this information and we now need to make a decision. We need to create a corrective measure. We need to fix the problem. And so what do we do? We, the cortex secretes aldosterone. Now, aldosterone right now in the adrenal gland is not going to do very much if it stays there. So we need to move it to its ultimate effector. In other words, we need to send it to the place that it's going to be able to carry out its function. So this aldosterone hormone, which, as I mentioned to you, is the third and final player in our story, and it needs to be sent off to its effector. In other words, the structure that is going to now solve our problem and respond. And the effector in this instance is the distal convoluted, I'm just going to put here con, like that, convoluted tubule. And again, if you are not familiar enough with the structure of your nephron, you're going to have to go back and you're going to have to cover that again. Now, once we get to the distal convoluted tubule, this is the aldosterone, it does one very, very important thing. And it increases the amount of our sodium, that's our sodium being absorbed. So we're going to absorb it. Where are we absorbing it? Please don't forget, back into the blood. That's important. Okay, that's where it's supposed to be going, back into the blood. But something that a lot of people forget when they do this answer is that sodium is one of the salts we actually are moving around. There is a second that many, many, many people forget to mention, and that is potassium. Now, what's interesting, and I'm going to write it off to the side here, is that excess potassium is excreted. What does that mean? It is removed from the blood. Now, why? We need to have a perfect balance between sodium and potassium. Again, you would have learned about the sodium-potassium pump. It's a really important pump that works in the membranes of cells to move substances across concentration gradients. And so you have to keep the balance between these two uh, minerals uh, equal or to their equilibrium. And so that is the other one that many people forget to mention. But it's important to note that you are excreting potassium. So that means you don't want it to stay in the blood. You want it to leave the blood and actually go into the urine itself. Now, as always, I like to finish off my lessons with a terminology recap. You can use these words for flashcards, mind maps, any summaries that you're making as you study. Now, in the beginning, we spoke about osmolarity, which, remember, is the way in which the body regulates the amount of water and salt. And so osmolarity means that how salty or how watery your blood or your fluids are in your body. 
Then I spoke about the afferent arterial. Remember, those are the incoming little arteries that go into the Malphigian body or the renal capsule. And they are the ones that are responsible for picking up a drop in salt. They then produce a substance called renin. Renin then stimulates the substance angiotensin. And angiotensin is sent to the adrenal cortex in the adrenal gland to say, we don't have enough salt, please do something about it. The adrenal cortex then takes that information and secretes the hormone aldosterone. Aldosterone is then sent to the distal convoluted tubule, which is the tubule at the very end of the nephron. It's where reabsorption will take place. And we reabsorb sodium, but we excrete potassium. In other words, we put sodium back into the blood and we put potassium into the urine to be excreted. Now, as always, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and make sure your notifications are turned on because I post every Tuesday and Thursday. And I will see you all again soon. Bye.